Hello, my name is Garnet Gilmore, and I am the Director of Marketing and Sales at Warwick Forest. We are your premier sponsor for the Lifelong Learning Society. Today, we're filming in the Commons Community Room. The Commons Community Room is a multi-purpose area, and actually, this area, we can move the furniture, we can have a band, and we can create an entire dance floor for our parties. If you would like to see more of our amenities at Warwick Forest, please visit our website and take a virtual tour or give us a call and we can take an in-person tour, masking and social distancing, of course. Today, I'm introducing Kim Liebold. Kim Liebold is a nurse practitioner with cardiology at Riverside. After graduating from the Riverside School of Professional Nursing, Kim earned a Bachelor of Science from nursing in Christopher Newport University and a Master of Science in Nursing from Virginia Commonwealth University. She is board certified as an adult nurse practitioner by the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners Certification Board. Kim has over 30 years of cardiology experience at Riverside with more than 20 years as a nurse practitioner. She has expertise in heart rhythm management and specializes in the care of patients who require pacemakers, defibrillators, ablations, and left atrial appendage closure implants. Born and raised in Smithfield, Kim is a country girl who loves this area and its seasons, beauty, history, and wonderful people. She and her family enjoy the great outdoors, the outer banks, and their dog. Kim enjoys running and mission work with her church and her work family. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining me today. I just wanted to kind of um, have my face up first for you to see before we started the slides that will have most of the information on it. And to let you know that you are um, actually in my office, and I can't tell you that this is probably the first time I have had my mask off in here in a long time, so it feels pretty strange. Um, but um, we are actively seeing patients in the office, so if you do hear some um, noises or something, um, that is kind of, uh, we're trying to keep it quiet, but I just wanted to let you know that I am uh, in the office setting. So I'm going to start um, our slides and we'll kind of begin. You can go ahead and start the slides if you will. So today you are um, signed up to kind of uh, do Cardiac Devices 101. And we'll be covering uh, different types of devices and hopefully you'll kind of learn a little bit about how they're different um, and who would need what type of device. Uh, some of you may have devices or um, know someone who does. Our practice uh, has actually over 2,500 people that have devices implanted. There is a lot of people with them on the peninsula. I think we just lost our slides. The second part, I'll just keep talking while she's bringing the slides up. That's fine. Um, the second part of our talk will be um, on um, a quick moment of uh, uh, hands only CPR and AED awareness. That's a passion of mine that any opportunity that I get to talk to people, but I like to um, share that opportunity on how to save lives. Um, and so I'm going to share that with you today. So um, I have no disclaimers uh, for the talk. We'll go ahead to the next slide. So I am one of uh, three in the team of the electrophysiology um, providers here at uh, Riverside Regional. Dr. Jamshid Aladini and Dr. Scott Kaufman are the electrophysiologists, and I am the uh, nurse practitioner that works as part of the team. Next slide. Uh, people often ask, what is an electrophysiologist? You will hear us also call uh, it EP. Um, and so our cardiac electrophysiologists are cardiologists that specialize in the diagnosis and management of the heart's electrical system uh, with medical therapy, ablation procedures, and or cardiac device implants. An, an EP may implant and monitor devices that either help the heart's electrical system function properly or measure the heart rhythm. These devices include pacemakers, implantable cardiac defibrillators, or ICDs um, is often the word you hear, cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, which are often called heart failure devices, and implanted heart rhythm monitors, which we call loop recorders. Often our patients refer to us as the heart electricians. So I always kind of 
hook around with the patients and say, if you were a house, we would be your electricians and that we would be called if you have problems with your wiring. Um, next slide. So this is one of the rooms that we work in. This is the hybrid OR, which is one of our brand new uh, operating rooms here at Riverside Regional. That is a, um, a hybrid. So it is a, um, a combination of an operating room and our um, path lab type imaging um, with a lot of um, modalities that uh, allow us to do some pretty amazing things in there. Um, this is our team as we are working uh, with a lead extraction. And so when patients have um, devices in for long periods of time, of course, years and years, um, and something may happen, which it's not that common, but it can, um, you sometimes need to take the device out. Well, as you can imagine, been in the body for many years, scar tissue and calcium um, kind of adheres to the um, leads and the pacemaker. We can't just remove it. So we go into this OR and we use a laser and we're able to actually um, basically kind of push off the um, scar tissue from the lead so that we can remove it so the entire system can come out if needed or a particular lead and then we can re-implant um, what needs to be done. So this is one of the areas that we do. We also do our watchman procedure here which is the left atrial appendage closure um, which is a device that is not related to electricity but it is what we use for our patients who have AFib, who are on a blood thinner and cannot be on long-term um, blood thinners because of stroke, I mean, because of bleeds or fall risk, but they need to have something to protect them from a stroke. And this is a small implant that we're able to do um, to help them. And that's, again, another conversation we'll be glad to share with you uh, in a lecture series down the road. Um, but this is all where we do that activity. Next slide. So I wanted to start off the talk because a lot of times there's confusion between um, words that we use in cardiology um, like cardiac arrest versus heart attack. And they sound very similar and in some situations they do occur in the same um, setting or episode, but they are very different. So if you look at the left of your screen, the picture basically says cardiac arrest. And under it, it says uh, cardiac arrest is electrical problem. And if you see the heart, you're seeing all the little starburst kind of things in the bottom chambers. And that's to signify electrical activity that's kind of gone haywire. It's just kind of not um, working as it should. And that is where EP or the electricians work on the heart. So it's during the electrical phase uh, or the wiring of the heart that cardiac arrest or arrhythmias occur. On the right side of your chart, uh, of your um, um, screen, you'll see the word heart attack. And a heart attack is a circulation problem. So that is more the arteries and the blood flow getting to the heart muscle, carrying um, blood and oxygen there. That is um, when a blockage occurs and it may be plaque that has ruptured or a blood clot that forms in your artery and occludes it and so no blood flow goes the muscle of the heart and then a heart attack occurs and um, that is when you would go into the hospital or emerge, uh, urgently to take you to the cath lab and that would be our um, uh, interventional cardiologist which we call our plumbers um, and they open up the artery and get blood flow. It is also where people could have bypass surgeries um, if they have blockages there. So it is two different things that we talk about. We talk about the electrical activity of the heart and we talk about the circulation or the plumbing of the heart. In a heart attack, and you'll see in another slide later on in our talk, um, it can happen at the same time. Often when somebody has a heart attack and there's no blood flow getting to the heart muscle, obviously the heart uh, is not going to like that and the heart tissue dies. When heart tissue dies, then arrhythmias happen and they will go in cardiac arrest. And those are the people that will have the cardiac arrest um, when they're in the setting of a heart attack. Um, so we do see both, but there is a, dis uh, a, a one to make sure you understood the differences. So next slide, please. So again, we're gonna focus now on the electrical system of the heart and how it works. So I just want you to visualize this for a second. Um, think of this like a, a lamp and the wiring of a lamp or you know anything that's electrical. The 
heart has so many amazing things. Um, when you're talking about muscles and you're talking about valves and you're talking about arteries like we were a minute ago, this is the electrical activity as it goes through the heart. And there's various places where different things occur and where different devices can help um, depending on where the issue is. So um, it does make a difference when we talk about um, if a pacemaker or a defibrillator has one lead or two leads or three leads, um, it just depends on where that electrical activity needs to um, help the heart's um, own system. So um, next slide, please. So we're going to um, click on this video for a second. It's a little bit technical, but it kind of will um, show you the uh, natural electrical conduction system of the heart and how it sends the signals um, to the heart muscle to contract and push the blood out that's oxygenated to the body. So that's the whole point of the electrical activity is to send electrical impulses to make something happen, and that's to make the heart beat and to apply blood flow. So, of course, that's essential uh, for this. So if you can just click on the video. Action potential to originate in the sinoatrial node and travel across the wall of the atrium from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node. Action potentials pass slowly through the atrioventricular node to give the atria time to contract. They then pass rapidly along the atrioventricular bundle, which extends from the atrioventricular node through the fibrous skeleton into the interventricular septum. The atrioventricular bundle divides into right and left bundle branches and action potentials descend rapidly to the apex of each ventricle along the bundle branches. Action potentials are carried by the Purkinje fibers from the bundle branches to the ventricular walls. The rapid conduction from the atrioventricular bundle to the ends of the Purkinje fibers allows the ventricular muscle cells to contract in unison, providing a strong contraction. Thank you. Um, actually, um, we had a great question that I'm going to answer um, uh, related to the last slide from Patricia. She wanted to know, how do you tell whether someone's having a cardiac um, arrest or a, a heart attack? And that's an excellent, uh, uh, excellent question. The heart attack, it kind of varies. I mean, most people with heart attacks, you, hopefully, you know, you can tell from some symptoms that they may have the classic pain, um, sweatiness, nausea, radiation of the discomfort down their arm, the neck, the jaw, that kind of clues you in that there's something going on. A cardiac arrest, um, usually sometimes there is no warning. That is the person that drops down and collapses in front of you. That's the person across the finish line after a marathon that collapses on the ground and, and the heart just goes into an electrical arrhythmia and cannot support a pulse or a um, blood flow and just collapses. Um, but again, when, a cert when certain heart attacks are major um, and they, you can have those uh, quick symptoms that you really don't know about and then collapse. And so there is a difference sometimes on the presentation. A heart attack, you can usually tell from symptoms that suggest that that's going on. Uh, and if it continues or gets worse, then sometimes the cardiac arrest can occur in that setting. Okay, um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to do this very quickly um, because I think it's important for us to understand the electrical activity. So when we go talk about these pacemakers and defibrillators and where they are, it makes a little bit of sense. Um, we have our own natural pacemaker in our heart. That's called the sinoatrial node or the SA node. And that is right up here um, in this um, area here. And that is the um, group of specialized cells located. Uh, in that area that will discharge electrical impulses at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. That's why our, our normal rhythm, our normal heart rate at rest is somewhere between 60 and 100 because this is our pacemaker that regulates that and that's the, what it's supposed to do. Um, it controls the heart rate so when you're sleeping at night that heart rate naturally would probably go in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, depending on the person, and when you're active or upset, or it, it speeds up. And so that's the natural um, pacemaker. And when we have electrical issues, that does not work sometimes. The second um, um, stop in the electrical conduction uh, system is the AV node, which is the atrial ventricular node. And that is named because this is the top chamber of the heart, and that's the atrium. This is the bottom chamber of the heart, and that's the ventricle. So it's the atrial ventricular node. So it connects. Two chambers, electrical impulses come from one down to the other. 
this um, helps regulate bottom chamber. So if this did not work up here, this node, um, this AV node, would allow the heart rate to kind of be at around 40 beats per minute, 30 beats per minute. So um, it's certainly not something that people are going to be able to tolerate a long time. Um, and that's when people might have symptoms in bringing them into the office or hospital. And we find that something's wrong with this conduction system. And this is not working up here in the uh, atrium like we are supposed to. And that sometimes, as we'll learn in a minute, an indication for a pacemaker. Let you go to the next slide. Um, I have another question here um, from uh, Patricia, and it's be done for cardiac arrest. And I am so glad you asked that question, Patricia. Hang tight. Don't go anywhere. At the end of this talk, we're going to learn two easy steps of what to do for um, a cardiac arrest situation. Um, our normal conduction system is just, um, this is a slide just to kind of show you again all the different things that occur, but it just travels from uh, point A to point B, and then it goes down and produces the heartbeat. So when there's an issue, sometimes it's in various places, it creates us to know, do we need to put a pacemaker lead in the top, the bottom, what, what, is, what is the issue? Uh, next slide. So I'm going to show you a rhythm. You can bring the next slide. There you go. Um, this is just a rhythm strip, um, and that means this is a uh, heartbeat. Um, you've, if you've ever seen an EKG or if you've ever been into the hospital and been monitored, you see that little beeper if you watch TV and you see all those on the monitor. Um, this is normal sinus rhythm. This is what we all hope to be in, and this is what we are supposed to be. Um, so when you look at basically this first little hump, it's called a P wave, and that's the electrical impulse as it goes from that natural pacemaker up in the top of the heart through that atrium down to that uh, AV node, which is that mid station. Then this tall spike is when the electrical impulses goes through the bottom chambers of the heart, both the right and left at the same time. And that's the heartbeat, that pulse. If you were looking at this EKG and feeling your um, pulse, you would feel your heart beat every time you see one of these tall spikes. This is a uh, relaxation time of the heart. It's called the T wave. And then it gears back up to beat again. So this is what you typically see in a regular rhythm. And that's, you know, 60 to 100 beats a minute. That heart rate is about 72. All right, next slide. So who needs a cardiac device and why? Um, many cardiac devices are designed to help control irregular heartbeats in people with heart rhythm disorders. These irregularities caused by problems with the heart's electrical system, which then signals the heart um, to not maybe contract the, um, the um, blood uh, as it should, and people will have symptoms, and so we'll talk about those. There are basically two types that you we kind of categorize them in, and I want you to think about it as uh, a Brady, which is the medical word for slow heart rates, or um, sometimes there's pauses in the heart rate, um, and that's usually pacemakers. Those are people who need help with um, keeping their heart rate from going too slow or may pass out or faint because they had a pause or their heart, you know, just did not um, keep the rate that it needed. Tacky devices is the medical word for fast heart. And they need defibrillators. Um, and often the heart failure patients need what we call synchronization therapy. And we'll go through that. And they are available in both pacemakers and defibrillators. So from this slide, you can see there are differences. A lot of people just call everything a pacemaker, and that's not the case. Um, they are very unique. They're programmed very differently, and they're all individualized based on what the person's need are. And a lot of times in our patient population, you may start off with a pacemaker, and things may change. We may, we may change it to a defibrillator later in the life um, um, cycle because of other um, cardiac issues. Um, next slide. So I'm going to go through these kind of fast. This is sinus bradycardia. So just the quick look, you can tell there's not as many of these tall spikes as it was in the other picture. So this is slow heart rate, um, you know, probably about, you know, 40 um, beats per minute. Next slide. This is a next slide. Okay. This is something called Brady Tacky syndrome. We also call it sick sinus syndrome, and that just means the sinus node is sick. It's not, the pacemaker is not really regulating it like it should. What you're seeing here is fast heart rate, then you have this pause, and then you have a pickup slower heart rate. And what we do in this setting for a lot of people is eventually 
they needed to use medications to control this fast heart rate, then we worry that it'll make this get worse. So a lot of times they have to have a pacemaker put in, so then we can concentrate on the fast heart rate with our medications um, is often the situation. Next slide. This is um, third degree uh, AV block, and this is heart block. So if you've ever heard anybody say they had to have a pacemaker because they had uh, advanced heart block or complete heart block, that's what this is. And I'm not gonna get too technical with it, but you can see the little humps. That's the top chamber of the heart kind of doing its thing. It's marching on through. These little bumps up here are part of that. Then these are the big spikes of the bottom chamber of the heart doing its thing. And that's much slower. That's probably about 40 beats, 30 beats per minute. Um, and that's what pulse. This is what you would feel. These big beats of what you would feel. You would not feel these little ones. And it means the top chamber is doing one thing and the bottom is doing something totally different. And they're not paying attention to either one of themselves. And so this person, unless they had something um, going on, um, like Lyme's disease that they would need to recover from, and we would, you know, just watch them, um, make sure they're okay during this time in the hospital, or they may have medications that might be causing that, and we would take them off of it and see if it corrected itself. Otherwise, this person would uh, definitely get a pacemaker. Next slide. This is just a quick little thing called a sinus arrest, and it basically is normal rhythm, and then whoop, it just kind of, you know, doesn't do anything, and then it picks back up. That um, is just kind of like a misbeat in some ways, and that can be totally innocent, but if that goes for long periods of time, as you can imagine, if that stretched across this entire um, strip, um, people would be symptomatic with that, and so some pacemakers may be required. Next, next slide. So this is the pacemaker we're talking about, um, and the purpose is to maintain um, rhythm. It's to keep it from letting it be too slow. That's, that's it. That is the primary thing of a pacemaker, is to give you that safety net um, of having a rhythm where you um, don't worry about it going too slow. Um, some patients who have them in use them 100% of the time. Other people use them um, uh, intermittently because the heart is going to do what it can with its own electrical conduction system. The uh, ability with these devices, it will sense and it will let your heart do what it can do. And it will pace um, only when it needs to. And we have that ability to program it and do all kinds of things to individualize it to the patient's need. Um, there is um, uh, the, the battery life of these pacemakers now. They're lithium batteries and they're about 10 years. So, um, Seven years, and again, it's like anything with a battery. How much you use it is um, how long sometimes you get out of your battery. But for most people, they're they're good for ten years before we have to um, replace the um, just the generator piece there. Uh, next slide. So indications for pacing: Who would need a pacemaker? Next slide. <clears throat> this is technical, and I'm just showing it to you to know that there are classifications. And um, that's part of our job in uh, electrophysiology and anybody in plants, we have to make sure that we're not just a pacemaker and somebody who doesn't need it. So there's um, symptoms and uh, rhythm issues and things that you have to go through. Um, just because you think you might need a pacemaker uh, doesn't mean that's the case. And also this is what insurances and other people you know, who pay use for criteria to say, yes, that is appropriate and yes, we will cover it. Um, next slide. Possible symptoms when someone needs a pacemaker, they can vary, and these symptoms could be for many things. As you look at those, I'm sure you could all tell me that you probably have those, um, except maybe the last one on, on uh, many days. Um, the syncope is a fainting or nearly fainting. That can be, of course, from that really slow heart rate or that long pause we saw. Dizziness um, can also come from that confusion where you're not really feeling like your thought processes or light is. is um, fine-tuned um, and limited exercise tolerance where you try to get up and go to the chair and you just don't feel like you can go because get up and gone has left you and it's because that heart rate might be slow and when some people have a really really slow heart rates um, they have an increased risk sometimes for procedure next um, paragraph my slide sorry so when we look at considerations, we always are looking at underlying cardiac disease, uh, other things that might be going on that might be causing the, uh, the electrical conduction system to have issues um, before we just you know permanently put a pacemaker in. There's a lot of thought going to it. Um, the necessity of medications, maybe people 
to come off their medicines and don't need a pacemaker, but maybe they need those beta blockers if they have coronary disease or heart failure and they can't be on them if their heart rate's too slow. So we can put a pacemaker in in those times to help that. Uh, we look at patients' lifestyles, the desire of the patient's family, their overall physical and mental condition. Um, I will tell you, we um, change the pacemaker out on people, as I said, every 10 years or so. Um, just that top generator piece, not the wires that go into the heart. Um, and we've changed the device out on a 100-year-old man um, before. Um, so it's, you know, people are up and moving around and doing great. You certainly don't want them to get dizzy and faint and fall and break a hip and their quality of life decline. So the pacemaker is utilized pretty much throughout the lifespan. There's not a lot of um, you know, reasons why we wouldn't unless it's, um, you know, a, a patient or family request or a particular situation. Next slide. So that's the, this is the pacing system really quickly. Um, it is usually in the non-dominant side. So if you're right-handed, we put it in your left side. If you're um, left-handed, we put it in your right side. And that's because we don't want you to overuse the shoulder arm so much in the wear and tear where the device is. So usually if you use that non-dominant side less in life. Um, so the pacemaker sits up uh, in a pocket um, of the subcutaneous tissue under the skin, under the collarbone, um, and the leads come out of it. This is generated with the computer that has all the technology and the battery. These are the leads that attach it as it comes down. Um, it's coming down and it's sparking one lead right here in the top chamber of the heart. And then there's a second lead that's coming down here in the bottom chamber of the heart. Um, um, so that is a dual chamber pacemaker, meaning it has two leads, and it can help us with the top and bottom uh, of the heart electrical conduction system. And you can see the natural conduction system um, here outlined, and it will do its own thing and do as much as it can. And the pacer is there to sense and monitor and be active when it needs to be. Next. Next slide. Can you advance to the next slide? Okay. Okay. Um, and so that's just a generator. That's a um, the, just the size of it, um, about two uh, silver dollars. It used to be really big, um, and we'll see a slide on that in a second. Next slide. These are the leads that we place in the heart. They're very, very flexible. I'm using this picture just more so you can see how they can just twist up and turn around, and um, you know they're not hard. We call them wires, but they're very, very flexible um, leads. Next slide. This is one to show you that once we put the lead in the heart, um, it kind of, as you can imagine, if you're poking this down into the inner lining of the inside of the heart, it's going to cause an inflammation, um, and then it's going to cause some scar and fiber, and that's what's going to basically seal that lead and not let it move. When you get a pacemaker or any kind of device implanted, we're cautious with you using that arm um, where the pacemaker is implanted for, you know, several weeks to a month to allow this process to happen. Because if you go and jerk your shoulder up, you could pull that lead out if, you know, if it was just freshly implanted. Um, so we have to let that process happen. It also reflects the first um, comment I made when uh, we have to take the leads out of somebody after they've had them in for many years. You can see this, you know, the fiber and the, um, um, scar tissue will adhere to them and keep them really, really secure. So um, that just shows you that aspect. Next slide. So this is an x-ray of somebody who has a pacemaker. Just wanted to show you, um, we can also identify a lot of times, we don't know what pacer you have. You can identify it sometimes by a pacemaker, by an x-ray, how it looks, shape, and sometimes you can even read on it. But this is the little generator, the battery. Here's the leads, thumbs up, circles around. First one goes to the inside of the top part of the chart of the heart and the second lead goes to the bottom of the heart so that's what your pacemaker looks like in your chest on an x-ray on the left side next slide this is something we are doing now here at riverside too it is a leadless pacemaker and it is yes that's small it is the size of a little bit um, bigger than like um nickel 
Um, and this is a new technology um, kind of designed for people who only need to be paced in the bottom chamber of the heart, like someone who has chronic atrial fibrillation. Um, and um, perhaps we use this more if someone has had device issues with leads and they've had infections and we've had to take it out and we are able to just actually implant that into the bottom chamber of the heart, into the muscle. It just kind of, you see these little hooks on the side here. They just kind of, you kind of hook them in almost like a fish hook into the um, septum, which is the wall uh, on the inner wall of the um, bottom chamber of the heart. And it just faces the heart. Next slide. So the, this is the x-ray of that. So you see here is the little leadless pacemaker. It's called the Micra. It's down here in the bottom. That's a pacemaker. There's nothing up here. Um, I'm going to play, I have her click on this slide here, and it's going to look weird because it just is the way it, it flips in the video. But that is an actual um, device we implanted, and the process is just for you to see that there is a, um, there was a little bit of a, um, you can click it one more time. There is a, a catheter we use to advance it and then it kind of sits in the heart um, and we pull that catheter out so that's how we get it in. There you go. You can see that is the pacemaker and this is what we use to put it in and once we take this away then it just kind of stays in the heart and it moves because it's moving with the heart. It's beating. Next paragraph, I mean next page, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we have now just finished our um, um, pacemaker stuff. Um, we're going to move a little bit um, faster through the defibrillators um, from time's sake. But a, a lot of it I needed to kind of just share the electrical conduction system so you understood that as we move into these devices, um, which now are the tacky devices. So these are the ones that if someone has um, fast heart rates that are life-threatening to prevent um, sudden cardiac death. Um, these are the devices um, that are implanted. I call this uh, your own personal little AED uh, that is in your chest, um, monitoring your heart all the time and providing you services um, uh, if uh, needed. I actually have another question that I'll answer. It says, how do you physically implant these devices? Um, we um, take you to that um, a room similar to the one you saw in the first picture. We um, enter um, uh, through the, um, we cleanse everything. We enter through a vein up in the top uh, chest area. We and make an incision, place the generator in a, a, a pocket of subcutaneous tissue, kind of like a, a letter going into an envelope. And then we attach those leads, slide them into the heart through that major um, vessel. It is a vein. And goes and it goes right into the top chamber of the heart, and those little hooks that you kind of saw go into the heart, kind of will go and secure it, and then one goes to the bottom chamber of the heart, and we um, monitor it, make sure it's working well, and then we uh, suture it up, and you're done. Um, so these are um, basic pacemakers um, can be um, uh, usually at one overnight stay. If they're just changing the generator and the leads are fine, those we do outpatient. Um, so we'll go to the defibrillators. Next slide. So again, um, people with heart failure are often at uh, risk for life-threatening, fast, irregular heartbeats called ventricular arrhythmias. These people may need a combination of either a, a biventricular pacemaker or an implantable defibrillator or AICD, which shocks the heart back to normal if they were to have a life-threatening um, heart rhythm. Uh, the ventricular arrhythmias occur with uh, when irregular heartbeats originate in the uh, bottom chambers of the heart, um, and they don't produce um, blood flow. In other words, it's a short circuit, and it doesn't produce a pulse, and so there is not going to be life. Um, patients will get very symptomatic very quickly and collapse um, and need emergent help. Um, next slide. Um, so um, the purpose of an, uh, a cardiac defibrillator is to break fast rhythms. It's to stop it. Um, most all of them, um, except for uh, subcutaneous, which I'll show you in a second, um, have backup pacemaker feet. They are not intended to um, pace people because these people have no problem with their heart rate on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they're, they don't need a pacemaker to keep their heart rate a certain level for the most part, but they do have a backup and it can pace them at a rate of 40 beats per minute. Um, but they are primarily just sitting in the chest, 
monitoring, monitoring, and hopefully never needed to be used, but could save the life of the people and do every day. There are different kinds of those as well, and we won't get into the technical piece, but again, they are um, um, based on the patient's needs. Next page, next number. So, so these, um, this is going to be a quick two-part um, um, little video, and this is when um, people can have that first scenario where you have a heart attack and a blockage, and then there's no blood flow getting to the heart muscle, and when the heart muscle dies, then of course the electrical system does not like that, and then the electrical system will not get the blood flow it needs, um, and it will um, go into an arrhythmia that can does not produce a heart um, beat and causes sudden death. So this is that person who suddenly has a severe, massive uh, heart attack, grabs the chest and hits the ground almost at the same time. Um, and this one, you may not have any um, symptoms beforehand, or they may have had a little bit of chest pain or, um, you know, but it was a, a very quick event. Uh, click on the uh, left side first, please. The culprit responsible for your heart attack is called plaque. Plaques are fatty deposits that line the arteries that feed blood to your heart. Over time, the plaques enlarge and narrow the artery. A heart attack occurs when the plaque ruptures or explodes causing a blood clot to form and totally close off the blood supply to an area of your heart. That darkened area can form a scar. Okay, now the right side. The scar not only impairs pumping, but it can act like a lightning bolt. And like a lightning bolt, it often appears without warning, creating a fatal heart rhythm called ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so you can see when you saw that on the right side, when that happens, the fibrillation, and I, and I need to make sure, because a lot of people get this very confused, fibrillation is quivering of the heart muscle, it fibrillates, it quivers. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that people have, thousands and thousands and thousands of people have it. That is the quivering of the top chamber of the heart. That is not life-threatening. Uh, people can live with it and don't even know it. Um, there are certainly um, treatments for it and risk for a stroke. Uh, but when the bottom chamber fibrillates, that's ventricular fibrillation, that is sudden death. This is what um, reduces the um, pumping of the blood flow. This is the muscle where it pushes the blood flow out of the heart and causes the pulse. If this sits and quivers uh, like a bag of worms just sitting there uh, like jello, nothing's happening. No blood flow is getting out, no pulse, um, the person um, dies. So it is very, very important to not hear the word fibrillation and think atrial fibrillation because that is the most common thing you hear. These are two different um, chambers of the heart doing two totally different things. Next slide, please. So the indications um, for um, a device, this is more of a technical slide, and I'm just going to say it really quickly. Um, if someone is primary prevention, so when you're primarily trying to prevent something, you're trying to keep them from having it in the first place. They've never had cardiac arrest. They've never had a sudden death. Um, so these are people who are at risk. And these could be people who have heart failure that um, no matter how um, aggressive we've been with medical treatment and with um, therapies, um, we just can't get the heart strength to get better. Um, the heart strength is less than or equal to 35%, which is about half the normal strength of the heart muscle. That's um, the normal strength is about 55, 60. But when you have chronic, long-term, weakening heart muscle, um, you are more at risk for arrhythmias, and they do, they do meet criteria for the devices to prevent them from hopefully ever having to have had a, an arrest. Um, the other con um, people are um, called cardiomyopathy, and these are people who have weakened heart muscles from other causes. It could be from coronary disease where they've had heart attacks and have scar tissue, and it, it creates damage to the muscle. Um, and usually for those people, they have to, um, they've had a heart attack and they put a stent in. They have to wait a good um, three months, uh, 90 days a lot of times give the heart time to recover because a lot of times the heart hibernates. It's like, what, what's going on? 
Um, why, are, why am I all of a sudden not getting blood flow? And it kind of just shuts itself down for preservation. Once we open that blood flow up with stents and medicine, um, a lot of times that heart strength comes right back. And so we want to wait that period. Of time. We don't want to put a device in somebody that they don't need. Um, so um, those are situations. Also, people can have weakened heart muscles from um, drugs um, like chemotherapy, certain medications and chemotherapy can do it. Um, sometimes postpartum after a woman has a baby, it can happen to a very few people, sometimes a genetic. Um, and, and you see those families that have um, multiple people in it that have defibrillators um, and had um, you know, sudden death in their family. Um, and then the long QT syndrome is, again, a genetic thing where um, it predisposes families. And those are the ones that um, uh, need the defibrillators because they are at risk. Secondary prevention is you have survived one. You had an out of hospital or hospital cardiac arrest that did not have anything to do with um, like a heart attack at the time, um, that didn't have any other kind of treatment that would say this is the reason for it and it wouldn't probably happen again. Um, they, um, you survive one, you get a defibrillator um, because you're likely to have that again or more likely than the average person. We use those criteria, the same as the pacemakers, to determine who gets them. Um, and uh, the uh, insurances use that criteria to pay for them. Uh, next um, slide. This is the doctor who invented it, um, and he was a uh, cardiologist, electrophysiologist, and he watched his partner um, die from a cardiac arrest and couldn't help him. And so he de dedicated his career coming up with something to help. Um, and so he, I think the first device probably came out in the late 80s. He was alive um, when um, the first one was able to be utilized, but he was the beginning research for AICDs primarily because he watched his friend um, die and couldn't do anything about it. Uh, next, no, next slide. This is just a quick thing to show you. This is how it all started in the um, beginning um, technology with just um, um, little Duracell batteries trying to figure out how to, to make a little defibrillator that would fit in a body. Next slide. These are just kind of historic pictures to kind of help us through. Uh, this is the first one that was used. It was very big. Um, it, you couldn't do anything about um, program it to be individualized. It just um, was in the body and it had to be implanted in the abdomen, the stomach. It was so big. And I remember when I first started my career having quite a few patients that had them in their stomach. Um, but now we don't. We put them up in the chest where the pacemakers are. Next one. Uh, this is the size of it. They're much smaller. They're about the size of three silver dollars, um, and they are programmable. They have multiple leads. Um, they have different kind of technologies depending on what you need. We're able to um, monitor these uh, remotely from home uh, as well as the pacemakers um, um, so that people don't have to come in. And we can tell when they have arrhythmias or issues even a lot of times before they do. They get shocked, we know about it. Um, and so we have a whole team of amazing nurses here. As I said, we have 2,500 devices in our community uh, for just from our practice. And um, we monitor those um, a lot. Um, so next slide. This just shows you the inside uh, of it. And uh, my uh, device rep who helped me with a lot of these uh, slides and allowed me to have some of this historical stuff um, so this is her favorite slide. It says, an implantable heart device relies on computer technology at work. Back in the days, ICDs have more computer power than the original Apollo spacecraft. So that just shows you um, just the amazing technology that has come forward in, in these, kind of, these areas uh, and allowed them to be smaller and smarter. Next um, slide. So this is um, an automatic defibrillator um, implant. So I'm going to let her click on it, and it'll just show you how we put it in. That'll kind of answer also that uh, other um, um, question about how we put in a pacer. There are kind of pretty done very similar. Okay, you can show it. Here's how the defibrillator is implanted. This pacemaker-like device is about the size of three silver dollars. It's placed under the skin just below the collarbone. Signals from the two wires or leads that are threaded into the heart's chambers monitor every single heartbeat. If a lethal rhythm appears, the defibrillator shocks the heart back to a normal rhythm. Okay, so you can see how that works. So what I tell my patients 
because um, I do a lot of education, as you can imagine, um, psychologically. Um, this is kind of a big deal, and people kind of um, are concerned about it. Um, but I tell them it's like your own little personal emergency room or your own little personal AED. I could not be standing across the room for you, watch you collapse, get to you, put the pads on, and shock you um, anywhere close to the time this does it. Um, and a lot of patients don't lose consciousness um, if this happens because it is so fast. Um, and again, we have hundreds and hundreds of patients who have this in. And um, many never, ever have it go off ever, but they have that safety net in case they do. Other people, it saves their lives multiple times. Um, so um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, this is kind of a statistical slide, and I will kind of just um, share with you, basically, we know, and this is going to kind of tie into what do we do about cardiac arrest. Um, uh, we know that over um, anywhere between 350 to 400, 50,000 people in the United States um, die from a cardiac arrest or have a cardiac arrest each year, only 20 to 30 percent survive. Um, and out of hospital arrest, 90 percent of the people don't survive. Um, and it, of course, is the most common mode of death because it's the stop of the heart. Um, and 80 to 90 percent of it is coming from bottom chamber rhythms, um, which is the cause of it. Um, the statistics I'm going to share with you at the end of our lecture is that 70 percent of these occur in your home. And so every minute counts. And um, when the people that are high risk have these defibrillators in, it shocks them. And their family members don't even hardly know that it's happening. Or the patient just says, oh, I think I got shocked. Um, if they didn't have it in, um, then um, you would be in a situation of a sudden cardiac arrest and needing to call 911 and start CPR. So you can see why. Um, People do very well when they have a high risk for this and have a long life um, to have these in to have that support. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, this is going to be a slide that's going to go back and um, kind of uh, reflect what I said of who is a candidate for these um, defibrillators. And the, the highest predicting um, factor is what is someone's ejection fraction or their um, squeeze uh, of the heart. The heart ejects and pushes the blood volume out of uh, the bottom chamber uh, every time there's a heartbeat. And normally it would produce about 55, 60% of its volume gets pushed out with heat. As the heart weakens because of a heart attack or any of those other things I said that can cause a weakened heart muscle, it just doesn't have to push. And because of that and the other circumstances, it is much more likely to have arrhythmia. So when people have low ejection fractions or low EF, they're the ones that are sent to the electrophysiologist to talk about what can we do to prevent your risk for sudden cardiac arrest. And they are the ones that are more likely to have the defibrillator. Go ahead and um, show that video. Out of these one half blood that holds the heat. One or more heart attacks can cause a dramatic fall in the ejection fraction. When less than one third of the blood is ejected, the risk for sudden cardiac death goes way up. So that's just kind of showing you that heart on the right is big, it's baggy, and it's kind of weak. So it just doesn't um, function as well. So not only in the pumping power um, causing congestive uh, increased risk for congestive heart failure, but also in the electrical um, activity, increasing its risk for um, arrhythmias. This is probably my favorite slide that I use um, in clinic um, when I'm talking to patients. Um, this is a slide that basically says if you had 20 people and uh, all of these people, all these 20 people had cardiac arrest and they collapsed and out of the hospital system, um, they collapsed, 19 of these people will die before help can get to them. One person will survive out of 20. This one person is who I want you and your loved ones to be, and that's why you need to listen at the end of the video when we talk about hands-only CPR and AED awareness, um, because that is the person who has had somebody who stepped up and started hands-only CPR or CPR and got 911 to them quickly or had an AED that was um, placed and, and shocked them and got them back. Um, so that is a, my take home message is uh, be that person, be that first, very first responder 
to, to jump in and help um, and take the time to go and learn CPR and learn and be aware of what an AED is and how we can use it. For our defibrillator patients that have them implanted, if it's the same 20 people and these all these people had defibrillators implanted because they had indication and needed one, 19 of those people would survive. One person would die. Um, and that's because when a heart is very, very sick for a long period of time, no matter what we implant and no matter how many times we shock the heart, sometimes it won't survive. Um, that's, you know, that's life. Um, so this is a very powerful slide and I use it quite a bit for patients with defibrillators um, in and for my population in large. Next um, uh, slide. A great question. Someone asked, how do you measure the ejection fraction? Um, the most common is an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart. We can also do it from a MUGA scan and we can also do it from a nuclear um, stress test, uh, but echo is the most common one we use. This is just a quick slide on um, a rhythm. If you were to look at a rhythm, which we can see these things when we have these devices in, this is the patient's normal rhythm, and then this is when they have the sudden um, fibrillation of the bottom chamber of the heart. So as you can visualize now from the videos I showed, the bottom of the heart is quivering. Again, this is the bottom of the heart, not the top. This is not atrial fibrillation. This is ventricular fibrillation, bottom chamber. This fibrillates, so as it's just sitting there quivering like a bag of worms, there is no pulse, there is no blood flow going out of the heart. It starts at 6.02, it gets smaller at 6.05, at 6.07 it's going down further and smaller and finer and it's just kind of barely beating. At 6.11 it's flatlined and there's no activity electrically at all in the heart. It is during this phase, and if you can get a defibrillator to shock it, whether you've got one implanted or you have an AED, um, you can get that person back very quickly with uh, really good outcomes. If you're doing CPR during all this time, you are um, giving blood flow to the brain uh, until help can arrive to shock and get them there. The quicker you do stuff, the better off the chances are. And so this slide just shows you within nine minutes what happens. Next slide. I'm going to, um, next slide, we're going to move through a few of these on because I do want to get to that CPR. This is the um, defibrillator that is um, subcutaneous. It's actually under the skin. This is not in the heart. Um, we use this for a lot of young people that we don't want to put hardware in their heart. And people who have some infections that we may not want to put it in. Next slide. Um, again, this is just showing the difference. Next slide. Um, when this is the last part we're going to talk about the devices and then we're going to talk about the CPR real quick and then I'll open up for any other questions that I haven't answered. Um, this is just showing you a little bit about uh, multiple kind of leads and we can put an extra lead. You've seen me talk about putting a lead at the top chamber uh, and the bottom chamber on the, uh, on the right side of the heart, which is your left on this screen. Um, but we also can put a lead on the left side of the heart. And that's called the left ventricular lead, and that's what we call the heart failure lead. Uh, next slide. And that can help us with the need for pacing both sides of the heart at the same time. Um, this is called resynchronization therapy, and we use it a lot in heart failure patients. It can be done in a pacemaker or a defibrillator. Um, so for time's sake, I'm, I'm not going to read that, but what I'm going to just tell you is that um, a lot of times when the heart is um, um, not um, squeezing like it should, a low ejection fraction, or the pacemaker is just pacing the heart on the right side. It tends to kind of not squeeze and push and push that blood flow out as well. It kind of tends to rock a little bit. It kind of goes from right side to left side, right side to left side, instead of right and left coming together. Um, and so we can put a pacemaker lead on the right side and the left side of the heart, and we can tell the heart now squeeze and pace at the exact same time, just like a normal heart would, we're able to get the strength sometimes back, improve the injection fraction of the heart. So it might go from 35%, 10, 20%, uh, and they go up to 40%. This also helps with heart failure symptoms, um, the shortness of breath, the fluid retention, and uh, reduces admissions to the hospital. Um, so we, we do that uh, in pacemakers and defibrillators. Next slide. 
Um, and again, this is just showing you that in a clear picture. Um, this is the generator of the pacemaker. This is the uh, top lead. This is the right uh, ventricular or bottom lead. This is the left lead. So this lead is sitting here. This lead is sitting here. Both of them are being paced at the same time. And it squeezes that chamber um, symmetrically. Um, so they get their symmetry back. They get their um, coordination back, which again, makes that a more efficient pump, which is more blood out. Next slide. I'm watching our time here. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing good. Um, our uh, last thing is just very quick. It's called a loop recorder. And these, uh, we sometimes we are asked to put these in patients uh, um, that have had fainting spells, syncope, that we can't figure out why are they fainting and we think it might be a heart rhythm issue, but we're not capturing it on a halter monitor or we're not capturing it on a uh, event monitor that you wear for 30 days. Um, and we also put these in people who have cryptogenic strokes. A cryptogenic stroke is a stroke where you don't know what caused it. You know the person had a stroke, but you can't figure out what caused it when they come in the hospital. And a very, very common reason for a stroke is atrial fibrillation because of the irregularity of how it um, allows blood to go looking through the heart. Blood clots can form in it and can push out and go to the brain and cause a stroke. And if you're not on a blood thinner or have a watchman implant, then you are high risk for a stroke. And so if you have a stroke and we can't figure out why, they'll ask cardiology to, uh, EPs to come in and we will put these loop recorders in and you'll see it. It's a little device that slides up under the skin and the chest. It allows us to monitor their heart rhythm for three years. Um, that's, there you go. And there, that's perfect. You can stay on that slide. Um, it allows us to monitor your rhythm for three years so that we can see if you have AFib and you may never even know it. Some people never feel it. Um, but we are trying to help them figure out, is that the cause of um, the um, stroke? If you're a fainting person, we're looking for slow heart rates. We're looking for long pauses. We're looking for that heart block, like those rhythms we saw at the beginning that just aren't showing up no matter where, uh, what, how many EKGs we do. This is a, a concept we can use. Next slide. Uh, and that just shows you where it goes. It's a little, it looks like a, a little thumb drive that goes under the skin. Uh, right under the chest. We just put it in, um, takes two seconds, and um, a lot of times patients just leave them in after the battery's dead after three or four years because you can't see it and it doesn't bother you. Next slide. Um, the, I'm just showing you this real quick for a second. Um, this is a Zoll Life Vest. There's a lot of people who may have heard of this before. This is like an external or uh, outside um, way of uh, protecting people during that time. Maybe they had a heart attack and their heart strength is, is weak. And we're trying to um, protect them um, while we're waiting that three month period to determine do they need an implantable defibrillator or do they not? So this is something they can wear external on their body that um, will actually monitor them and um, look at rhythms. And if the person is awake, um, it will signal them to, um, you know, that it's going to shock them. And if, as long as they're awake, that means they're getting enough blood flow to their head. They, they don't want to be shocked. They just know to, you know, call, go to the hospital or figure out if they're feeling bad, they go present somewhere. If they collapse, like we talked about before, this will automatically shock them. And it, um, it, it's blue dye out. And then you see, if you come up on somebody and you see them wearing this and have blue dye, then you know that they were shocked it can save their life and then we um, bring them in uh, obviously uh, and can put a defibrillator in uh, but it's it's something that the insurance covers um, uh, under certain um, certain diagnosis and times next slide we we'll just skip the video because that's a long video on that from time stake go ahead to the next one if we have time and y'all want to see it we'll come back um, this is um, where I can have some questions but what I'm going to do because I've answered most of the questions um, I'm going to go into, because we have 15 minutes, I'm going to go and make sure I get to the CPR part and then answer all questions. But I do have one more. This is, do blood pressure readings give indications of atrial fib? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, there is um, some correlation because um, static blood pressure are looking for that heart and that regular. Um, in an atrial fibrillation, it beats are very erratic and very irregular. So a lot of times patients will that they have that little button on their 
blood pressure monitor that lights up and the lights are air um, or they may air out and say it can't figure it out because it's trying to get that regulated. So that can the regular beats. It doesn't mean that it's atrial fibrillation. It just may mean that it but it also could be a fib. So you know, if you see that a lot, um, you can bring it up to the attention of your um, primary care provider or your doctor, um, and they can you know kind of go into it a little bit more. And there's halter monitors and things that you can use or other devices that you can do. If you have AFib, you will see it um, on your monitor regular all the time. Uh, next slide. These I'm going to move through kind of quickly. Um, October is Sudden Cardiac Arrest Awareness Month. That is one of the reasons I picked this um, time to come talk with you. Um, and it is very important um, to realize, as I said, 350,000, 450,000 people a year die from sudden arrest. So these are the organizations that support this. So you can see it's the big American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, Children's Cardiomyopathy, Heart Rhythm Society. All some of the major cardiac foundations support this and the education to prevention um, for these um, people. Next slide. You can go ahead and next slide. We'll move through, through these a lot quicker. So hands-only CPR and AED awareness, it's a life-saving lesson. And then I'm going to share it with you here, and it's very quick. Next slide. Some of these slides you'll have seen before. Hands-only CPR is a two steps to save a life. Um, step number one is to identify anybody who, a teenager, adult that's in front of you that collapses suddenly, you immediately call 911. You act. You do um, something. Um, some people will think, oh, I don't know what to do. Somebody else in this crowd should probably know more than me. Everybody's going to stand and wait, and you wait for five minutes, and we know what happens to now to the heart rhythm in that time. Everybody's trying to decide who should step up. Um, particularly if it's your home and it's a loved one, it's you, and a lot of times it's you by yourself. Um, so you immediately call 911. Get someone to you. Get that uh, 911 operator on the phone. They'll help you walk through things. If you have a cell phone, I always tell you to put it on speaker. If you don't know how to do that, which um, just on a teenager or two-year-old now, I guess, um, and they can um, show you how to put it on the speaker. But if you have it on the speaker, then you can lay the phone beside you. You can start the chest, um, pressing the chest and doing the hands-only CPR while the dispatcher 911 operator is talking you through it. Um, so step number one, identify if a person collapses in front of you that's a teenager or adult, call 911. And step two is push hard and fast in the center of the chest at 100 to 120 beats per minute. That is keeping the blood flow of their oxygenated blood because they just dropped and their blood has oxygen in it. You're pushing their own oxygenated blood to their brain until help arrives and somebody can get that AED out and shock them and get that rhythm back. Next slide. Uh, these are the AEDs, which are in every um, major location. Please look for them. Please find them. You may be the one that runs in for someone. I encourage you to... Um, take a class, be familiar with it, to um, go online while you're home socially distancing, do the American Heart Association CPR anytime. You can learn how to do uh, CPR. You're not certified. You can learn how to do it. You can learn how to, to be comfortable with these as much as you can. And you can um, then go to a CPR class. They are still having them now. Um, um, they're back on board. But these AEDs are designed to be uh, not for um, uh, EMS to use, not for healthcare people. They are designed for the public because they are um, uh, basically a program of um, you identify, you put it on, and turn it on, and it tells you what to do. Uh, next slide. Um, so here's the same statistics, but this is what I really want you to hear. Again, over 350,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests occur every year. 90% of them, again, um, don't survive. They die before making it to the hospital. CPR can double or triple survival rates. So you can double or triple someone's life expectancy. 70% of the heart arrests occur in the home. Uh, and 46% of the people who suffer out-of-hospital arrests receive the help that they need before EMS arrives. So we want to see that 46 move up to 96. We want to see people um, out there helping um, their 
a community helping each other. Um, and uh, all of it is really just education and, and giving you some insight. Next um, slide. Here's my same slide. So here's that person. He got CPR and AED. So it increased his survival rate. Next slide. Um, again, every minute helps um, when you um, don't have CPR. Um, um, 10% um, survival rate is um, decreased every minute. So at five minutes, you're at a 50% survival rate. So it, it, it makes a difference. Next slide. Same slide, we, we kind of know the importance of that. Next slide. You can see I use them on the, go ahead to the, just click through these pretty quickly because there's a lot of them. Um, and I'm gonna um, skip this and go to the next slide because there's time I wanna. And someone put up the question um, that was beating at 100 to 120 beats per minute is pushing to the tune of song, staying alive. You get an A plus today. I don't know how we grade these classes, but you get an A plus. That is absolutely right. Um, that is the big part of um, American Heart Association is to learn a song that's at that tempo. Because when stress happens, and particularly if it's somebody you know that collapses in front of you, everything goes out of your brain. Um, but these two easy steps you can remember. And if you think of the song Staying Alive, which um, we have here for you, um, it, it, it helps you to know that's how fast you push. Um, these are just laws that, you know, believe it or not, every ninth grader in the state of Virginia knows how to do this um, because it's taught in school. The AEDs are not taught, but it is awareness. The schools have them in, um, and the teachers are taught. Um, students are aware of it. They all are taught hands-on CPR so law. This poor child died on the playground, and everybody stood around and waited for the ambulance. Um, so her parents went to um, um, and made a, and had a law, so it's Gwyneth's law. Um, this is the chain of survival, getting them from you to us. Um, and we can do a lot of amazing things that you've kind of learned through hopefully this um, um, session today. Uh, but we can't take care and, and help your loved one or you unless we can get to you, unless you can get to us. Um, so again, community support, CPR, AED awareness is key. I start at the beginning of the chain. Next number. Uh, next slide. These are just going to be quick slides. I'm going to move through a quick next slide. Because these are kind of, this is a lecture all of itself. Um, this again is the chest compression, um, pushing uh, 100 um, beats per minute, and we push down about two inches. So hard and fast. That's where it comes from. Just push hard and fast in the center of the chest. All you got to remember. Next slide. And that shows you your sandwich in the heart. And as you push down, the heart's pushing that blood out. Now you can visualize that heart pushing. You're doing it's the injection fraction. You're pushing that blood out to the brain with each beat you push down. Next slide. Uh, again, that's showing you the same thing. Next slide. Um, next slide. And I'm going to let you show this because this is very important. This um, kind of tells you it all in just a second. Go ahead, play that for me. If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, it's important to act fast. Helping to save a life is easier than you might think. Just start hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call 911 or call 911 yourself. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest then put your other hand on top of the first. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. It's important to push, giving 100 to 120 compressions per minute, which is about the same tempo as the song Stayin' Alive. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But if you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to try it. Remember, call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. To learn more, call 877-AHA-4CPR or visit heart.org slash hands-only CPR. Okay, next slide. 
that was one of the most important things. If we don't get to see anything else in the slides, that I wanted you to see. This is just a quick thing on AED awareness. Um, of course, um, again, we've talked about this a little bit. These are um, uh, external defibrillators that are on the walls of any um, major um, place. Um, next slide. Um, some question came up is, could I talk about the Good Samaritan Law? The Good Samaritan Law is a law that says, if you are helping someone to the best of your ability, you will not be sued. In other words, if you are trying to help somebody and you're doing the best that you can because you're being a good citizen um, and um, calling 911 and trying to do chest compressions, let's say the ribs break, are you going to get sued because the ribs break or are you going to get sued? And, and the answer is no, um, because we all know we want somebody to come and help us. Um, now, if you try to whip out your pocket knife and try to do open heart surgery, um, then that's a different story because that's outside of the normal scenario. So it is of common sense. If you are trying to help your fellow man and just doing the best that you can, there is protection um, from that. And that's called the Good Samaritan. And you can look that up and have more specifics, um, but hopefully that answers most of that. AEDs are um, uh, look differently. Um, most of the ones you'll see is the one on the top left. Next um, slide. I know time is, is um, coming up on us and I've answered all the questions. So I'm going to let her play this demo because I think this is important. We have a fear factor of these, dem uh, of these AEDs. No one wants to touch them. I think that they're going to really be high technical. And I do this at my church. I make all of my congregations very small church uh, in the country, and it takes a while for people to get to us. Um, and I show them that this is, you know, this is kind of foolproof. If you um, have somebody that's unresponsive um, and they're not answering, you call 911, you're doing CPR, and you have one, you really turn it on, and it tells you what to do. Um, I strongly recommend getting the CPR class, being, you know, certified in it. Um, uh, but this just, I want you to see this just so you see what it's like behind that red box. Go ahead and play this course. Now that you are familiar with the defibrillator, we will begin the demonstration. Pull on them to activate the defibrillator. Lift the protective cover up and away. By doing this, the device will guide you through the rescue process. Begin by removing all clothing from the patient's chest. Cut clothing if needed. When patient's chest is bare, remove protective cover and take out white adhesive pads. Look carefully at the pictures on the white adhesive pads. Peel one pad from the yellow plastic liner. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. When the first pad Look carefully at the picture on the second pad. Peel the second pad from the yellow plastic line. Place pad exactly as shown in the picture. Press firmly to patient's bare skin. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. No one should touch the patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Press the flashing orange button now. Deliver shock now. Shock delivered. Be sure emergency medical services have been called. It is safe to touch the patient. Begin CPR. For help with CPR, press the flashing blue button. Play of one in the center of the chest between the nipples. Place your other hand on top of the first. Push the chest down firmly two inches. Keep time with the beat. Okay, you can stop the video there. You can go to the last slide for um, question information. Um, so I just want to say about the AED, and then I'll take any questions. I know we only got a minute left of the, oh, actually just flipped to 12, um, but I'm, I'm okay to stay for a few minutes to answer anything that I haven't answered. Um, with the AED, 
Um, it is um, crucial that the contact of the um, pads are on the skin. So that's the most important part. You saw the technology in that, is that it is looking uh, and telling you what to do. But just think of it as the eyes of the, um, the defibrillator are those patches. So if someone's wet or sweaty, um, you need to wipe off the chest if there is um, chest hair. Um, most of them have uh, like little razors in the kit that you shave off so you can have good connectivity from the pad to the skin so it can read well. Um, so it tells you what to do. If it is not connected well, it will say reconnect the pads, reconnect the pads. So it won't do anything else. If you push the button because you want it to do something, it may analyze and say, um, um, continue CPR, no shock advised. And you're like, well, I need you to shock it. That's the healthcare people. We want like, I need to shock it. It's not indicated, so it won't do it. Um, so it's, I'm not advocating that you immediately go pull off an AED and use it. That's not what I'm saying. But it is there in the community for public access for reasons, and it's for the people to go train, learn about them, be um, certified, work with your um, places that have them, your schools, your theaters, um, their uh, um, administrators in those areas that get trained for them so that they know what to do. Um, knowing where it is, knowing what it is, knowing to go run and get it for somebody who knows uh, or is comfortable using it. Um, that's what they're there for. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little sneak preview of what it looked like behind that red. Um, I think we have a couple um, uh, questions here. Um, it says, does the AD shock the heart more than once? The answer is, if it, yes, if it needs to. So it will shock it the first time, and then it will tell you to do CPR. And then it will tell you to stop, and it will analyze again. And it will analyze if it feels like it has a rhythm that is shockable. Um, think of that picture where the waves were really, um, had a lot of low activity. It picks up that and says, yes, I can shock that and get that back. It will advise you to shock. If it is not something that's shockable, it will tell you to call not, make sure you call 911 and continue CPR. So it's talking you through, do what needs to be done. Um, it will not shock if it doesn't think it can. Um, and it will not, um, you know, it won't shock you like multiple times if you push the button. It is only going to do it when it's kind of detecting the right thing. It's the same basic technology that we have in the internal defibrillators or rhythm detection that we have implanted in patients. It's some of the same algorithms and technology that we have. So it's not something to fear. It's something to um, um, be embraced and to learn and to utilize in our community the best way we can. And so American Heart Association has a lot of online stuff. I encourage you when you're socially distanced to, to go on that website, learn um, the uh, CPR anytime, uh, hands-only CPR, look at the AED stuff, go to your community um, rescue squads and different classes that um, have when they open back up um, and learn about the AED and, and be comfortable with it um, and be one of those people that feel comfortable uh, having it and taking it off the wall and helping someone because it may be your loved one. It may be the one that you're there with. Um, I think I think that is, um, um, it says, in lifelong learning, it says, we have one located in the Yoder barn and on the lower level office for lifelong learning. Uh, and I remember when I came there two years ago and we did this just um, as the only topic. And we had you down on the floor doing CPR with my uh, hands, only CPR with our mannequins. Uh, we looked at the AED. So my, my homework for you in this class that you've done is to find your AEDs. You're so used to kind of finding where is the exit on um, when you're in a hotel or uh, when you're in an airplane. Find your AEDs. Know where they are, particularly when they're in places that you are frequent. Know your church. Know your um, community. Um, Find out who is the person who, who knows how to use that and would use it. Um, you know who to go to and be maybe that person that volunteers to learn about it um, because it is not designed for us to wait for paramedics to get there and they have their own. They'll bring their own. This is for us before they come. Police have it in their cars. Um, fire trucks have it on them. This is what they're using. It's the same that's on the walls. Um, 
I believe that is all the questions. Um, is there any more questions? I know we're on time. Um, hopefully this information has been helpful. I hope I have not created any um, fear for you. It's not been a fear. It's been more of a power of it. So you kind of know all the amazing cardiology technology. If you have any questions um, um, or said, in, I said anything that's confused you, please um, reach out. The ladies who helped me organize this will get those questions to me and I will make sure I clarify. But um, be the very, very first responder. Know your body, know your patient, uh, know your um, uh, community. Um, do that CPR if needed. Learn that information. It is a uh, amazing thing. Thank you, and y'all have a blessed day.